Why am I here? Where am I going? <laughs> these are questions the human spirit asks. These are, these are aspirations of um, selfhood. Aspirations of the human heart made in the image and likeness of God. The Bible uses three approaches to answer those questions. The only, the only verse I know about that has all three groups in it is Jeremiah 18.18. 18, that God tells us uh, when and how to worship. Gives us the different lights in the night and day sky for times to meet Him. And those that deal with that when and where and how we call priest. And then God sent people who tell us why do we come and examine the motives of our heart as we deal with normal issues of life. And these, these that deal with those motives and call us back to God are we call the prophets. But today I want to deal with this third group that uh, we don't deal with much. Um, I don't hear a lot of sermons about this particular group. Uh, we could call them the wise men of Israel. We could call them sages. Uh, they are those uh, thinkers and philosophers that looked at life, uh, quite often a religious life, and asked the questions that nobody else wanted to ask. And uh, confronted traditionalism and its shallow answers to life's deep questions. It's one of these sages that I want to talk about. Uh, his name is Coleth. Uh, you know him as Ecclesiastes. Um, I think this book uh, may be a more poignant message to Western materialism than any book in the Old Testament because it plums the death of life without God. Now, I want to kind of work through chapters 1 and 2, make a comment about chapter 3, and move very quickly to a New Testament perspective on this. And I, I hope you brought your Bibles. Um, I do not believe that Solomon wrote this. Boy, you know, you're in class and you say that and people said, well, my Bible says Solomon wrote it. Yeah, but it's a study Bible. God didn't write that. Some fool did. Get over it. I mean, just when you tell Baptists something they never heard, you're a liberal. Now, I want to show you in your text why I don't think Solomon wrote this, but why I think Solomon is the person behind chapters 1 and 2. Now, if we want to talk about somebody who had everything the world says ought to make you happy, everything that um, just superlative in every area, we think of Solomon. So this author is picking up on the fame, the resources of King Solomon and using it as a literary foil to the shallowness of materialism. Now if you look at chapter 1 verse 12, I think you can get the first clue. Chapter 1 verse 16 is the second clue. I, the preacher... Now, if you have NIV, it says was king. My New American Standard says has been or have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. Now, what's the problem with Solomon had been king? What's the problem with Solomon was king? Was there ever a time in Solomon's life after he became king that he wasn't king before he died? The rabbis get so frustrated with this, they say, well, for a period of time... Because of Solomon's rebellion against God, an angel took his place on the throne. And that's what this verse means. Oh, slap your grandmother. <laughs> now look at verse 16 with me for a minute. Chapter 1, verse 16. And I said to myself, I have magnified and increased in wisdom more than all who were over Jerusalem before me. What's the problem with that? How many were over Jerusalem before him? How many? David, his daddy. Amen? Because it wasn't until David's time that he captured the citadel of the Jebusites and turned Jerusalem into the capital of Israel. 
There were no all who were before. The author is trying with literary clues to show you this is not Solomon, but I'm using Solomon as a foil against those who think if they only had da 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 they would be happy. Now, I want you to know, of all the people in the Old Testament, the saddest story is the story of Solomon. Here is a man of wisdom beyond his peers, maybe beyond the ages. A, a singer like his dad wrote proverbs and songs. A man that had everything given to him because of who he was. And I want you to know the, the name that is most prominent in black magic is Solomon. Solomon's wives pulled his heart away from the Lord. He began to offer sacrifices to foreign gods. If he started out smart, he, he sure ended stupid. So he is a foil for the folly of thinking certain things can make me happy if I only had them. Isn't it amazing? We're looking, well, put it culture. When my ship comes in, then I'll be happy. When I do this, I'll be happy. When I get this, I'll be happy. If you're not happy right now with who you are and what you have, nothing in this world can make you happy. Nothing. But we've got to hear that because we live in a culture that magnifies things, possessions, attainments, credentials. Now, I hope you'll follow with me. I've got about five or six things here. I think they're all in the text. I hope you'll look at them. But I want to I show you two key phrases that are used over and over in Ecclesiastes. Now, everybody who studies this book would certainly not agree with me. This, this is not a... Um, um, scholars just don't agree on how to interpret this book. I think I have found the key. Two recurrent phrases. One, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. You know that one, right? And the word vanity means nothingness. There's a dual play here. Because the word nothingness in Hebrew also refers to idols. Idols are nothing. They have no existence. There's, there's a play on nothingness and idolatry. The other is under the sun. Now, I think what Solomon is doing, and this is the key phrase, I think. If you take life, take life and just cut off the top. Cut off, just cut off the spiritual. Just cut off God. And you say, do you remember that song by Helen Redding? Is that all there is to? And, and Helen Redding in this song goes through life. Is that all there is to love? Is that all there is to marriage? Is that all there is to children? Is that all there is? And she takes everything that culture said, if you had this, you would be happy. And at the end, she stands in the ruins of her life and says... Is that all there is? Well, that is the hunger of the human heart. That's the hunger of man without God. So when you say under the sun, I think the inspired sage is saying, if this is all there is, life without God, if the physical is all there is, it's vanity of vanity. There's nothing new. Uh, everything has been, will be. It, it's, it's so discouraging. It's so discouraging. And yet we search and search for meaning in the midst of the physical and the possession and the I and wonder why there is no joy and peace, stability. Now I would think it starts in chapter 1, verse 13. This is a, the beginning of the list of what Solomon tries to find happiness of which he will not. And I set my mind to seek and explore by wisdom concerning all that has been done under heaven. And it's a grievous task which God has given the sons of men to be afflicted with. Drop down to 18 with me for a minute. Because in much wisdom there is much grief. Increasing knowledge results in increasing pain. Um, I can walk into a library. Go to the religion section. And if I was the fastest reader in the world, I could never read all the books in my lifetime. Knowledge is increasing at such an exponential rate that even in our chosen field of expertise, we cannot stay current with the literature. 
The more you know, the more you know you don't know. I mean, oh, the peace of first-year seminary students. <laughs> think they know everything. You know, um, I think um, I'm an academic person. Uh, I, I rejoice in knowledge. I rejoice in trying to equip young people to have knowledge. But you know, um, graduation day can be the saddest day in the life of a young person. Because now they have that thing that they've said all their life. If, if I only had a degree. If I only, now they got the degree and they realize for the first time all these friends that I've had for four years I'll probably never see again. And the job market stinks. And I got a $70,000 bill. And where's the joy I was supposed to have? Now, I'd rather be educated than uneducated. But if you think educated, if you think, well, if I just had a master's degree, if I just had a... I've met the stupidest people who are doctors. My, uh, I had a church in West Texas, about four blocks from Texas Tech, and um, I may have shared this with you. It just sticks in my mind. We had brilliant, oh, my soul, in their area. They were world-known, brilliant people, astrophysicists, theoretical mathematicians. I knew them because they came to my church. I knew their wife packed them a lunch and took them to work because these guys could not function at a cafeteria or Walmart by themselves. You know, when I work in a church, if I want something done, I don't call the guys who are experts. I call the guy with a sixth grade education that knows how to get it done without making everybody mad. There's two words in Hebrew, wisdom and knowledge, and they're different. If you think just knowing a lot of facts is going to give you success in life, I have real news for you. First of all, I bet most of the facts you think you know aren't facts at all, but opinions. And secondly, if you knew all the facts you still wouldn't have peace. Life is a mystery. You're not going to figure it out. If you're not happy, unless you know, you're never going to be happy. We, off, we promise more than we can deliver in the area of education. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. So I said to myself, come now, I'll test you with pleasure. So enjoy yourself. And behold, it too was vanity. Look at verse 3. I explored how to stimulate my body with wine while my mind was guiding me wisely. Which, <laughs> that's tough. And how to take hold of folly. How many times do you ride the roller coaster before you just want to throw up? You know, most things that we do that we really enjoy, the first time you do it's the biggest kick. And every time after it, you're trying to catch the first again and you never can. Have you ever thought about it? Pleasure is an addiction of modern America. Just, just stimulate me. I, I want to do more. I want to be more. I want to experience more. It just, boy, as a pastor type, I'm just grieved how young people want to be adults so they can do and be independent and have free. And old people hang on to their younger days as long as they can. Isn't it funny? We long to be old and we long to be young and all the time we're miserable in the middle. What is the matter with us? Things without God are nothing. Things with God are everything. This Old Testament now, don't, don't be putting Jesus in here yet because this is Solomon. It's his kind of a foil. It's his way of saying where is happiness. And it's not in pleasure. Now this deal about... Um, this deal about stimulate my body. I must admit to you, I'm a little nervous that our culture allows people to get absolutely bombed and then says, but you don't use marijuana. Isn't it funny? We've taken one stimulating drug, made it legal, and made all the rest of them illegal. Now, do you see the dumbness in that? The dumbness is that I can find happiness in some kind of stimulant or depressant. If I just, if, if you can change the way I feel about life, I might find some meaning. I ask young people, why do you do that? Well, I just wanted to get away from the pressures. Holy spit, that was a bad choice. And conservative kids are the worst I've ever found in my life. 
We've had kids that come to Texas Tech from conservative homes that never had any freedom. They get to, they get to Tech and go nuts. I scrape them off the ceiling. Because their parents never gave them any free. And they think if they only can do this and have this and experience this, that their life will be meaningful and happy and fulfilled. And it's a cry of emptiness. If you have to put something in your body of any kind to be happy, I think it's fake. And it doesn't last. And suddenly it takes more and more and more to try to get the high you got the first time. Then who's in control? I grieve over a culture that can't find meaning in life without some kind of added chemical. Do you think you were created for chemicals? You say, you don't know. Oh, I do know. Look at this, look at this uh, thing about the possessions. Verse 4, chapter 2, verse 4. I enlarged my works. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I I made gardens and parks for myself. I planted all kinds of fruit trees. I made ponds of water for myself. I had male and female slaves, home-born slaves. Here's, Here's a person who had anything and everything they wanted. Man, if this doesn't speak to America. I got to build my own house. I got to design my own kitchen. And never stay home and cook. Thousands and thousands of square feet beyond what we need to live. And worried about because it's dusty. Flowers don't look good. Fill Fill our garages up with the most expensive cars you can buy. That lose value a third the day you drive them home. Think we're somebody because we drive some kind of car, park it in some kind of fancy garage, and live miserable lives surrounded by opulence. And you wonder why Islamic people want to blow us up? If you think you can find happiness in possessions, either you don't have anything or you're really dumb. How much does it take to make you happy? How many cars? I saw the most depressing statistic about those people who win the lottery. Millions and millions of money and 70 plus percent of them lose their wives, their kids won't talk to them, don't want to work and and are miserable people. If I just won, I'd be so happy. And winning destroys their lives. Does that tell you something of the falsehood of things And where is happiness found? American Christians sit in opulent churches like this, spoiled rotten, and wonder why there's no bang in life. Look at the last of verse 8. And the pleasure of men, many concubines... If I could just make love with a lot of women, I'd be happy. Now, you probably get AIDS, fool. But um, somebody said, I already know who it was. If you make love to one woman, you've made love to all women. If you make love to many women, you've made love to no women. There's something about that. I guess what, I work with young people a lot. They, they just, they breathe hormones. It's unbelievable. Just, you can see it in the air. I tell them this story. Do you remember, do you remember the swashbuckling, handsome, leading man? Um, his name just slipped me. Um, it's back in the black and white days. And uh, oh, he played all these dashing Errol Flynn. And it said that he made love to every, every leading lady that he ever worked with. So when he was about to die, somebody asked him, well, what was the best sex you ever had? And he called out his wife's name. Do you hear the stupidity of that? We're mad at homosexuals and make ourselves look conservative by kicking them in the face. And if we if we did the same thing with adulterers, we couldn't pay the light bill. 
Because American men get old and think, if I just have sex with somebody else, I'll be happy. Sex will not make you happy. I love sex. I vote for it every time. Amen. Sex, yes. Great idea God had. Yeah. But if you think that's going to give meaning and purpose to your life, you still don't get it. And yet how we run to these fountains of youth, pleasure, things, and wonder why we can't ever be filled. Verse 9. I became great and increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. Here's, here's the next one. Fame, notoriety. Uh, they say that many of us who are middle-aged, we... First thing you seek for is kind of stability. Next thing is, is, is somehow to actualize your potential, to become noted in your field. And yet how many people do I know that are noted in their field and miserable people? Can fame do that? You know, I, when do people we think are famous ever get to go out and have a cup of coffee with somebody without getting mobbed? They got to pay $3,000 a cup on some deserted island to do what you and I get to do every day downtown if we want to. Oh, if everybody knew my name, they'd mispronounce it. <laughs> this one, I just love this one. It's in about chapter 2, verse 18 or so, 17, 18. If you ask somebody, why are you doing this? They'll say, oh, it's for my kids. I'm doing this for my kids. So Coleith says, how do you know your kids won't be stupid? <laughs> I've done all this for my kids. At first, that's a lie. And secondly, we ruin most of our children by giving them far too much so they appreciate nothing. Nothing. Because we didn't have, and so we give it to them, and they just are used to having everything. And it costs nothing to them. You, you're not going to be able to excuse the way you live. We work 60 hours a week, never home. And we're going to say, I'm doing it for my kids? I guess Augustine put it so succinctly for me when he said, there's a God-shaped hole in every human being. And because of the fall, we try so hard to find Something to fill that emptiness. So we try PhDs and pleasure and sex and drugs and money and more and me and mine. And there's still this gnawing hole, this emptiness. Surrounded by the opulence of American culture and unhappy and unfulfilled and purposeless. And Ecclesiastes, as few books, speak to that emptiness. Now, this is Old Testament now, so don't be expecting New, new Covenant stuff, but I... I think there is a, a word of wisdom here to people who have sought meaning in the things listed and others. Look at verse 24. There's several I'm going to read here. Kind of follow with me. There is nothing better for a man than to eat and drink and tell himself that his labor is good. This also I have seen that it is from the hand of God. Turn over to chapter 3 for a minute. Chapter 3, verses 12, 13, and 22. I know there's nothing better for them than to rejoice and do good in one's lifetime. Moreover, that every man who eats and drinks and sees good in his labor, it is a gift from God. Verse 22. I have seen that nothing is better than that the man should be happy in his activities, for this is his lot. Would you look at chapter 5, verse uh, 18? Uh, excuse me, let's see. 5, 18. Here is what I have seen to be good and fitting to eat and drink and enjoy oneself and all one's labor in which he toils under the sun during the few years that God of his life, which God has given him, for this is his reward. Um, Look at chapter 8. 
verse 15 with me. Chapter 8, verse 15. So I commended pleasure, for there is nothing good for a man under the sun except to eat and drink and to be merry. And this will stand by him in his toils throughout the days of his life, which God has given him under the sun. Look at chapter 9, 7 through 9. Go then, eat your bread in happiness and drink your wine with a cheerful heart, for God has already approved your works. Let your clothes be white all the time. Let not all be lacking from your head. Enjoy life with the woman whom you love all the days of your fleeting life that he has given you under the sun, for this is your reward in life and is your toil in which you have labored under the sun. I guess some of the country western songs uh, speak to this <laughs> better than any. Where are all the people who live together? What is, what is life for if you don't stay together? I see that picture in the in the Christian bookstores of that old man at a at a, a roughly uh, hewn table. And he's got a, a bowl of soup, and he's got a hard piece of bread. He's got these horn rimmed glasses sitting beside it, and he's giving thanks for that bowl of soup. We don't give thanks for lobsters because we've got so many lobsters. And yet here is a person that stops for a moment and says, "All I have is from God. Thank you, God, for the moment." I travel a lot and um, I catch myself speeding to get home to sit in the same room as Peggy. Now, I'm not talking about making love. I told you I like that, but I don't rush home to make love. I rush home just to sit beside this lady that God's given me to walk through life with. We've got to stop and smell the flowers. They're all around us. Like the... The path is good, not the goal. Once we reach the goal, usually there's emptiness. But every day is good. The simple pleasures of life is where happiness can be found. And they're the free pleasures. I meet people in churches that have dirt floors of such poverty I can't imagine. And I worship with them. And they're happy. And they love each other. Oh, 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 have we lost it in America? Rocking chair comfort seats. And we can't find happiness. Friends, if you know God, life can become wonderful every day, no matter what the circumstances. If you don't know God, You can be the wealthiest, smartest person with all the possessions and just be miserable. Do you know God? Do you talk to Him? When you go to sleep at night, do you know He's with you and for you? Circumstances don't contain His love or His anger. We live in a fallen world. Bad things happen. Happiness is not something we get. It's someone we are because the God-shaped hole has been filled by a loving God who came looking for us. And then suddenly all those things that we thought would make us happy become tools and avenues to help other people find God. And the spotlight is taken off of us and ours and mine, and me, and put on him and his. I don't care how much you make, I don't care where you live in America, you'll spend 10% more than you make on a credit card and put it all on yourself. How, I saw an article, how to spend 180000 and still not be happy in one of these. Slap that person, I'll try that. But do you really think if you get a better job and more money and more opportunities that life will be... I promise you, if life's not good today, you need to stop and say why. Because there's a lot of really poor, deprived people who are really happy today. And there are a lot of miserable materialists who have Jesus bumper sticker on their car and Christian jewelry 
and are absolutely uncontent with life. Where is happiness found? In the simple pleasures of life and knowing that God is with us and for us. Would you bow your heads with me? If I didn't speak to you, your hearing aid's gone. God loves you. I don't care who you are, what you've done, God loves you. Jesus is his ultimate sign of how much he loves you. What God wants more than anything for you is that you know him, that you talk to him, that you long to be with him. And it doesn't matter if you wear sandals in the dirt or alligator shoes on the carpet. And it doesn't matter if you're 14 or 84. And it doesn't matter if you've been to college or if you have a Ph.D. The real joy in life is not in human performance, human knowledge, human possessions. The real joy in life is taking God by the hand and enjoying the path. Thanking Him for the normal things that everybody in the world has and enjoys. But suddenly, through those glasses of the Spirit of God, wife, job, health, circumstances, children take on tremendous qualities. They become the focus. They become the heartbeat. They become the joy of a contented person. Oh, do you hear the Spirit of God calling to you? America! You can't find it in things. You can't find it in sex. You can't find it in drugs. But you can find it in Him. Won't you come to Him? When you've tried it all, will you come to Him? In Jesus' name.